So I'm going to switch over to the other side and go the Zoom way. And let us do it YFM style. Let's say a very big welcome to Mrs. Lucy Quest. Hi. I hope you can hear me and see me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we can hear you loud and clear. Hi. Hello and good morning to everyone, for everyone who's joining us. And thank you for having me. Good morning, Lucy. We hope you had a wonderful night. Yes, um, good, good, a good night's rest. Thank you very much. And I hope you had a good rest too. I did. You are looking good. Thank you for <laughs> deciding to spend time with us this morning. Thank you. So before we get straight into the interview, yesterday, um, Lucy and I had a conversation on Zoom. And I expressed my gratitude for getting a book, especially a side book from her through Emma, my boss. And so I felt like, before we get straight into the talk today, it's just nice I reciprocate such a kind gesture from a great personality. So Lucy, if you can see what I'm holding. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you. You're too kind. Thank you. I can see it. You're too kind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. When you came, you mentioned that communication was a bit of a challenge for you, of course. Uh, before you got in, you, you didn't speak any local dialect? Yeah, that, that's the case. That's what I was saying. So you asked, you asked a specific question about your culture shock. And yes. For me, it was about um, being in a hurry um, to um, adapt and fit in. And so I, I, I really set about learning um, language really, really quickly. That was my highest priority so I could play. Yes, I really, really loved to play as a child. Um, and yeah, I think that family is family and your country is a country. And I think coming in, you know, whatever shock it was in terms of moving country was yes. quickly come by the fact that everybody lovingly embraces, embraces you. Um, and you, I, I, I felt the need to also connect. So it wasn't so much um, a challenge that I, I, I got stuck in my mind as a memory. What stuck in my mind more was the fact that it was du during the, the hunger, um, uh, the 83 hunger in, in Ghana. And that was where yes. the real culture was. It wasn't so much the family, but more that the country as a whole was going through a very difficult mm -hmm. time. Um, and the unavailability of food was more than a culture shock. It was a life shock. Yeah. I mean, these were the challenges you faced. Obviously, I mean, you had a very good and normal time in London. When you came out here, when you stayed here while growing up, what were some of the pastime memories you had of London? I mean, things that you really missed about London. I mean, you experienced one or two things here, and you're like, Nah, they don't do this in London. I mean, <laughs> I want to go back to London. Yeah, it's it, it's interesting. I I don't think. Look, Ghana was tough at the time, and I say to <clears throat> excuse me, I say to most of our young people now that look, the vast majority of the people we call young today had not yeah. been born right. So this is an alien concept to them. It was a tough mm -hmm. time. I think for me, I was very wedded to the fact that Ghana was a great place. It was, um, my parents had always instilled in us, you know, the, the back home mentality, um, um, how it was, a, it was the best place. I love the fact that it was always sunny. I love the fact that yeah. you know, I was always by people who, who care. But the little things you miss, but you kind of translate. So, for instance, uh, when I was in, in, in the UK I, as a child, I loved going to the park. I loved just taking off, to, you know, with my brother and going to play in the Amazing. park which we don't have so much in Accra yet. We're getting there. Um, and, but you know what we used to do? We were living in Odoko and oh my goodness, my, my, we were an entourage with my, my cousin, uh -huh. siblings of a similar age. And we would just take off, you know, you're going, you're walking, next thing you know, you're in an official town, you're in different places, <laughs> you're, up, you're playing with different kids. So it was kind of, it's not the same as going to a park, except it. Yes. But it, our own way, it was okay to connect in a neighborly neighborhood, suburb, whatever you want to call it, kind of way. So you kind mm -hmm. of try. Yeah, I miss things like the park. Um, 
we weren't that big on fast food, but yes, occasionally my parents did allow us to have, um, you know, fast food and we didn't have any of those kinds of fast food in Ghana at the time. There's little mm-hmm. things, little child comforts that you kind of get used to. But I think because my parents had always, always focused on being adaptable, you, you translate, you figure out something else, some other way to make life work. But I think, you yes. know, I was in Ghana for years and when it gets really, really hard, then you start to think, mm, maybe I could be somewhere else and not, it not be as hard. But you take the rough with the smooth, basically, is, is what I say. You, you adapt to, to, to the environment you're in. Did, did you ever get to the point where you called your parents and said, I want to go back to London? Was that, oh, was, was that that one time? No, we, we all moved. So it was everybody was here, you see. So it's not like they, they sent me or we were all here. So... It was a conversation we had many times as a family mm. of wanting. It, it came up, it would come up depending on what's going on and we'd talk about it collectively as a family. Mm. But because it was a collective thing and we were all here um, and because my parents were very um, committed in some ways to the idea that being in Ghana was good for us, um, mm. we kind of embraced, embraced being there. But I'm sure in their own way they had their own difficulties, own, own difficulties that as parents they just... You kind of just carry on and and try to do the best by the kid, even mm. though you have yourself. Mm. So, do you remember I your first day at school, school in Ghana? Oh my goodness, no, I don't remember the first day at school, but I remember the early experience of being at school in Ghana. So when mm. I came to Ghana, I joined a school in um, at Atiko Junction called Happy okay. Home Academy. Yes, I know the school. It's still there. Um, it's still uh, there. I think it's still there. <laughs> It's still there. When I, I, yes. I, I checked. Back then, it was like seen as, you know, at least in uh-huh. our neighborhood as grand, but yeah, it's still there. But I remember coming in and, you know, th- by this time, people were beyond halfway through primary school. They'd formed their friendships. So I think school was where it was a bit harder to adapt, right? Because the, because people had formed their friendships, um, break time, they would go into their groups. Nothing, it's not, it's not personal. It's not like, because they go into their group, they don't like you. It's just they don't know you. Yes. Um, and I, I did feel a bit alone in those um, early months. And I remember going home to my mom and complaining. And, you know, you, you speak like a child. So my translation as a child is, the kids don't like me and they don't play with me. <laughs> and then the, and, and I, so I was just complaining, complaining, complaining. And my mom just looked me straight in the eye and said, Lucy, life is what you make it. So I understood, look, you need to go out there and find ways to connect. Don't come home and complain every day. Go and make life what you want it to be. Um, And I think after that, I never complained about the kids at school again. But it was initially a lonely existence uh, in the school. So is it right if we say that the lifestyle you were introduced to in Ghana, the lifestyle hacks that you had to pick up in order to fill the void built you into who you are today? I think all experiences um, shape us. Um, Mm. So whether it's life in London, which I'm not trying to pretend was perfect either, like both of my parents were were well employed and so so on. I don't mean economically. Every environment has Mm -hmm. um, its own challenges um, in in Ghana too. So all all of life comes together to shape and form who you, you are. But sometimes there's significant events that have a bigger impact than the normal day-to-day run. And, and I think coming to Ghana, the big thing that uh, sets me off, I believe, on this path was the fact that Ghana had a famine in 1983. Those were, the, the food was limited, rain, rain had been limited, so on and so forth. And mm-hmm. I think the, the national difficulties of 1983 definitely had a huge impact uh, and have con- contributed greatly to who I am today, for sure. Mm. Mm. That's great. Let's still talk about school. I mean, higher. You attended Wesley Girls uh, before enrolling at Presbyterian Boys Senior High School for Sixth Form. What ideals uh, did each one of these schools impart, you know, uh, uh, to you? Okay. What were some of the um, things that you yeah, look, I really like this question because sometimes we think of education very narrowly. 
Um, education, yes, is to inform and give us information and material that we can work with, we can improve our lives. But I think most importantly, especially now as a parent, I think about education through the lens of the values that the institution can also instill in you, um, the socialization that you get out of the, uh, the institution and so on. So it's more than just the studying. So I'm not going to talk about the studying and the, the materials for either of these schools because that was a given. I was in those schools because they were known for being good academic institutions. Um, you know, at Wesley Girls, um, we talk about live pure, speak true, right, wrong, follow the king. And I take those, those the, that, that, um, uh, that almost command very, not, not only literally, but to heart. Um, mm -hmm. Because when you really break it down as a value system, live pure, and it's a bib they're biblical references, right? But if you, if you th think about living pure, um, you know, it, it talks about integrity. It talks about doing the right thing by other people. Yes. It's connecting well. You know, speak true. Be honest. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't say it's green when it's yellow. Um, you know, so, so live pure, speak true. Right, wrong really means that as an individual, you mm -hmm. have a responsibility to right the wrongs of society. Today, there's a lot of talk about social justice and everyone I talk to around the world is talking about social justice, whether it's about race, whether it's about climate issues, whether it's about poverty. But that's what writing wrong is about. It's about taking the responsibility as a person to right the wrongs of your world, right? Um, and follow the king. Follow the king is a, is a Christian command, right? It is, it is doing what the Lord Jesus would have you do. So that's exactly. very clear. The value system is very clear. clear. Um, in addition to that value system, um, there's also the, the, the hugely positive um, socialization of being in, in an environment with um, girls and, and subsequently young women who are like you, who have, you know, you have a lot in common um, mm -hmm. and you don't have to overly worry about yourself as an individual, as a girl, but really about as your ability as a human being. That's true. So that's great socialization. And I could go on, but I'm going to limit it to that. The value system and the socialization, I think, were very had a very positive impact on me. I had been socialized at home not to think of myself as a girl, but as a human being with all my abilities. And I think Wesley Girls deeply reinforced, reinforced that message around you're an individual. Um, Prisek um, is... Um, um, it, it, I'll, try, I'll say it in English, but the the the, the line that Prisek is, in thy light we shall see light. I mean, how amazing okay. is that? In the light of God we shall see light. And if mm. in thy light we shall see light, then we have to be light, right? So there's this very strong uh, um, ethic around being a source of light. And you know what light, light does? They say when you have a, a small light and you put it in a dark room, suddenly the whole room is lit. Just exactly, it brightens up. So in the light of God, we will also see light and be light. So I think the value system that surrounded Pisek had a very um, um, positive impact in, you know, uh, and I love, um, you know, uh, if there are any Pisekans listening right, right now, um, <laughs> we love to sing. Um, and, and, and honestly, I don't have the voice of the voice. I'm not as good at this. <laughs> you can try. Be light, illumine it all. Be the be Muslim man. My Latin is not that great. That's either, Latin. But you, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Right? But, you know, so, so the value system, and you know it's it's a very mm. driven school around academics, but when you shift it now to the social context, it was the first time in many years as a young person transitioning into adulthood that was in a mixed environment. So you, you learn other social skills. You learn to hold your own. You learn... I guess some of the future real life experiences that you're going to have because you're in a, in a mixed environment. And again, you get to prepare yourself and, and it, you know, it flex your, your social muscles in, in this That's environment. Both schools, I, one of my friends from Wesley Girls once asked me whether I think that I would be who I am if mm -hmm. I didn't go to the sec. And this is somebody I'd spent five years with at, with, at Wesley Girls. And my instinctive response to her was yes, right? Because we all like to think that things would have been the same. And actually, she yeah. she turned to me and she said she didn't agree, that she mm -hmm. felt that she spent two years at Prisek 
was such a, a vital part of who I would go on to become because of my experiences. So again, I just like to remind everyone that all of our experiences count towards um, who we become. And I, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with her that she had better insight than I had that exactly. it definitely contributed positively. Wow, that's that's a good experience to share. I mean, usually people would share personal thoughts on how a phase in their life impacted their personal lives. But your view on the question I asked, I mean, your answer is quite broad. These are things that people fail to recognize in their journey through school, mm. socialization. These are things we unconsciously pick from our experience in school. And so it's super inspiring to know that you are very aware of these things and you do appreciate them. I mean, you build the future on what you experienced in the past. You mentioned friends. Yeah. Did you have any notable classmates, um, any famous people? Drop names. Let us know who <laughs> and who were in your class. Oh my goodness see this is the kind of trick question where um the, i'm i'm never gonna you know have the the right answer am i because um i'm going to forget some people i'm going to not <laughs> somebody need to be mentioned look i'm very i i feel very privileged that through this two two secondary schools that i went to i have um and even my primary school even happy home um there are people out there doing some really great, great work. So I'll try and, and mention a name or two from, from each because sure. I like the question for this simple fact. Nations are, are typically built by the people. And that sounds like saying the obvious, but I have to repeat it. It is the people that make the nation. It's not the resources. Yeah. It's me. And you raise people in generations and cohorts. And one generation and cohort should be um, standing on the shoulders of the neck. So, <clears throat> excuse That's me. That's true. Ancient people I know as part of, quote unquote, my cohort and my generation or my group, we have to recognize that there are those who have gone before this group and there are those who are going to come after this group and are already coming. Um, and it's all relevant. Like, it's not a, about who is better than the other, who's a, what the competition is. It's really about moving together. So, one of my classmates from primary school. Um, is um, called Sadiq, um, and Sadiq okay. is actually he's an ICGC pastor of, of his own church in the US. Oh right? wow! Uh, you know, I'm and, and many some people I know turn around and say, "Oh, Pastor Shadrach," and I smile. I don't, uh, not not Shadrach, Sadiq, and I don't say Sadiq. to them, "Oh, we were in primary school together." <laughs> you know, we're walking down the road in Spanish. <laughs> um, but he's an amazing Sadiq actor, and I think it's amazing to see you know someone that you walk the streets or come to, to be a strong man. Mm. man. Um, when I think of um, um, Wesley girls, um, look, again, what, those are five long years. So you get to know so many people, you know, the Eastern Regional um, Lead of Public Health, Dr. Um, Dr. Nana um, 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 Brichum, my classmate from Wesley girls, right? And I, I just admire That's the great. work leading um, in the region, um, and she's been in public health, you know, for, for many, um, uh, many, many years, um, and she's been such a great source of even education to people like me. You go to her and you say, well, what, what's going on? What should I be reading? And so, of course, and you know, right now, in the, during this pandemic, our public health doctors are right at the forefront of reading this, and I feel very honoured that I have a classmate like her who knows exactly not only what's going on, but she's actually driving and being part of the, the mm -hmm. solution to a great challenge, privilege, and, and um, honor to, to me. Um, I think about, um, so I'm trying to give you one each, so I'm not biased. Yeah, yeah sure. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> um, and then, um, Prisek, you had, you had one of my classmates on very recently, um, Patricia, the CEO of, oh, um, oh. again, um, um, okay. by my classmate from Prisek. So I mix it up. Met, there's a man in there, women, and there's one. <laughs> if I had to give you the whole list, we'd be here all morning. We we'll don't be have here. <laughs> that it's a cohort of people that really move things forward, and they're all driving um, the agenda in their own amazing mm. ways. Mm. It makes a positive um, impact on the country. I tell you what, 
one thing I know they are currently doing too is they are also in conversations right right now and are mentioning you. <laughs> they are proud of you as well. Thank you. Thank you. So you spent time in Ghana after, of course, you had moved with your family from London. After Presec, you got admission to the East London University, mm -hmm. right? Yes, How was, was the transition for you? I mean, you grew up in London. Parts of your childhood was in London. You came to Ghana, picked up a new life, and you had to go back to the life that you had missed. How was the experience like going back? That, I think, was more of the culture shock because um, the age... The age, you know, I was, I was in Ghana from nine to 19. And those are very formative years. So actually the person you become is very much influenced by those years and, and some of the norms and the ways you engage people and connect with people, even the way you study is very much um, formed and set in, in at, the, at those days. Going back to the UK at 19, was it a much um, bigger culture shock because you come as a little child under the your guidance of your parents, but you're going back as an adult, as a 19 year old, to try and find your feet, to navigate the world, um, to study um, and work and all that. And that that was hard. I remember that, especially having to strike a balance between sort of working and focusing forward on, on, on education. Sometimes I found it very, very um, challenging on me as, as, a, as an individual and as a, as a person to the point of sometimes I was brought to tears because something is, you know, I'm not afraid to say that sometimes life stretches you to the point where you really can do not much more than, than cry and wipe your tears and move on. But I think ultimately what matters is a focus on, on your goals. If you know what you want to achieve, mm. then you recognize that the twists and turns and challenges of today are part of the journey to get there, right? Um, what the yeah. other thing is so so then you start to focus on what can I do or what are the levers I, I, I have the levers I have that can help me get through this and for me one of the really helpful things was reconnecting with some of my friends from Ghana mm -hmm. who had also moved so that you had people who understood you who were going through a similar experience of transition that you could talk to you could um, connect with you could socialize with and hang, hang out with I was also fortunate that I had family um, in the UK, so I could go to family and seek guidance. Yeah. There's this documentation I need to fill in. What do I do? Is this place I need to go to? How do I get there? So you start to build your, I started to build a social foundation from the connections I, I, I had already through friends and family. And then you start to learn a new system, how things are done, how, how to, to move forward, how to, to connect. And, and gradually with time, it gets easier uh, and it becomes more second nature. Um, but whatever um, life throws and you focus on your goals, you find some goals and focus on them. Mm, wow, that's insightful. On to the next one. I understand you hold a first class honors degree in electrical engineering and uh, also from the E or UEL. Yeah. What would you say fueled your ambitions in engineering? And before that, what career path did you grow up wanting to get into? Okay, I'm going to sound like really boring because, okay, now my career, we can talk about later career and how that changed, but where I'm going to sound yeah. really boring that I always wanted to be an engineer. So that sounds really boring, <laughs> but I'll tell you why. why it's great. So my dad's an electrical and electronic engineer and being his um being the oldest child he, he didn't he didn't do this boy girl thing it was go and bring the toolbox let's fix this um change the plug so i'd grown up seeing this as normal like honestly when i was really young um and i'm, I'm telling i'm talking about like as young as six i guess if you had asked me then i would have assumed that everybody's house is the same that something is broken yes. and, you just, and i still now instinctively think of fixing things before calling somebody like I'll get the thing out whether it's a spanner or drilling a hole or whatever I'll just do it um so I think that foundation meant that I had a fundamental bias towards engineering already my dad worked yeah. really hard and pushed me a lot on math so that also become became something that was uh, very much second nature 
Um, and so going into getting through school and being encouraged as well at school to, to pursue um, STEM, it, it just kind of followed on. Now, somewhere along the line, I did um, question my choice before I went to university and I, I toyed with the idea of either um, studying chemical engineering instead or going to medical school. Um, so I, I quickly dismissed medical school because back then I naively thought that, look, if you're a doctor, you're bound to uh, have to yeah. what people bleed and so on. So I'm not going to be a doctor and that's how I passed it <laughs> without doing any research. That was kind of a weak excuse. Um, and then with chemical engineering, it just so happened that um, when I went to um, the UK and I was at UEL and at the time I was also working at Ford, Ford didn't really need chemical engineers. They, they needed electrical and mechanical and computer scientists. So invariably, it all meant that all roads ended up leading back to my original plan of becoming mm -hmm. an, electric, an electronic engineer. So that's a bit about career choice. The bit around... Uh, a, a first class look. I've always been very um, competitive academic. That I'm, I'm not even going to mince my words. It's always been the case academically, not competitive to the point of tramping on others because I don't believe in that. But but competitive in the in the point in the sense of pushing myself. In the sense of when I get something wrong, I will seek out somebody who knows the answer and mm. try and get the answer to learn from them. Because if somebody knows them, then I have an opportunity to learn. But my, my biggest inspiration that defined the goal of, um, of first class was, was this. I had, a, I had a friend from school, from, from Wesley Girls. And when we were in school, we, we, we weren't particularly close. She was, she was a year behind me. We weren't that close um, in, in uh, um, secondary school. But then she was very close to somebody I became extremely close friends with from Prisex. So that's how I got to yeah. know to know the girl who was my junior, uh, how I got to know her better. And I remember, um, her, and her father has passed away now, but I remember her father was in the UK at the time. We were young students. He was unwell. Mm -hmm. He knew us as, you know, girls in Ghana. So we're going to visit him. And as you do, you advise them. Um, and I remember him asking each of us what we were doing uh, yeah. with our life. What are you up to now? And, and when I told him what I was doing, he, he it, uh, and at the time I was in university, and when I told him uh, you know, what I was studying, where I was and everything, he looked me very straight in the eye and he said to me, you have to get a first class. That was okay. just his instruction to me. Now, I don't know why. Of course, he knew I was competitive, but I did well in school. But maybs as a, as a, as a grown-up, he also recognized that it was going to be challenging, but he needed to remind me that there had to be a goal in sight. So I'm grateful because yeah. those were playing in the back of my head that you're supposed to get the first class. Yeah. Even when I had to stay up all night to do the assignment, <laughs> I'm thinking, no, I agree with it. Um, so again, I, I, I really do not for any moment take for granted the people who come along your path. And sometimes it's just one sentence. It's one mm. powerful sentence. That's going to take you places, or sometimes you have a long relationship with them. Ultimately, it all counts to getting you to where you need to be. Mm. Wow, insightful! So, let me find out from you. While you were in school studying engineering, I mean, back then the notion was courses like that aren't really for women. Excuse my language. Did you have any other female classmates, or you were the only lady in there? So in my class, there were three of us, three women. Okay. Yeah, one. So the three of us, one obviously me from Ghana, one from Sri Lanka, and the other one from mm. Jamaica. And that's in my entire class. So no, you don't have to <laughs> apologize. Still, it's still the case that we do have low female participation in STEM fields, even though it's improved. It's improved, um, whether it's STEM or higher education, it's improving. Uh, from when I was in school, but we're, we're, we're still mm. not there. We'll have a journey ahead of us. Mm. Wow. After that, you did, well, you did engineering, electronic engineering, came out with first class and honest. Why did you decide to switch to business school to do your master's? I mean, I, let me yeah. understand the motive behind that. Okay, 
So to, uh, to explain part of that mo motive, let me rewind mm -hmm. to 93. Remember how I said the experience of a, a struggling Ghana had greatly influenced me? Yes. One of the things that in my little child's mind, I had, I had figured, but I didn't have the right language for, was that somehow I have to be part of the solution. I was convinced that, you know, you could make decisions and choices that would help some of these things go away. Now I know it's not that simple, but of course, it's still, mm -hmm. there is still a element to it. And, I, and that's how that seed was sown. I didn't have that seed before, at least I don't recall. And by the time I was more like 16, 17, still in Ghana, I, it had translated in my mind to the notion of leading business. And I had this of leading a, a company that would do different things. Again, I didn't have the word. So don't get me wrong. When I was 16, 17, I wasn't using the word, uh, the word like CEO. I was just thinking of leading something and being a decision maker, making things better. Mm -hmm. um, so by the time I, I decided to go to business school, I'd been working in engineering for a while. So, you know, actually practicing yeah. I was a product designer, a manufacturing um, engineer, setting up production lines, various um, aspects of, of engineering that were relevant to the automotive industry I practiced. But I realized that to lead the business, not just do the engineering and design products, but to lead the business. To lead the engineering I, business. Oh, to lead a company. Um, so the uh -huh. whole business, I had major gaps in my knowledge, right? Mm. So as a young engineer, I didn't know how the finances worked or how the books were kept. I didn't know how you actually understand what the customer wants. Like how, like yeah. the market people come and tell us that this is the car that customers will buy and we'll go and design it. But I actually don't know how they were having those conversations and telling us what the mm. customer wants. Um, I didn't know how you priced the product. I didn't, basically, all I knew was engineering. Okay. So I realized that I wanted to, to um, close the gaps I had between engineering and the rest of the business, right? And bear in mind that as part of my work as an engineer, as an engineer post-graduation, um, I had taken a, a professionalization route in engineering. So I'd become mm -hmm. a member a chartered member of the Institute of Engineering, which is like uh, you know, the way the accountants will take their chartered exams and so on. It was yeah. a, a professional engineering. So I've done that. So I felt that, okay, if I've gone down the, the professional engineering route, I don't also need a master's because a professional route really proves that you're a professional, right? You don't need, need a master, you're a professional. But I have all these other gaps that are wide open that I could either, and, I, and the way I rationalize it, now this is my engineering way of thinking coming to bear, I could either spend the next few years getting different jobs in the company, learning, going to work in marketing, that's going true. to work in, that's one route, you can do that, and it's a legitimate route. Or I could take the other route, which is shorter, it won't give me all the experience I need, but it'll give me the knowledge I need. The knowledge you need. Get going. So I chose the, the, the MBA route because I would get the knowledge I need in those fields. And then I'll, I'll build on that into the future. Mm -hmm. So really that's where the, the, the incentive, the motive came from. The motive, motive was how do I plug my obvious gaps? It's always important to constantly over time analyze your gaps, the gaps between mm -hmm. where you are and where you want to get to and fill them. Don't do things for the sake of doing them. Just do it because it's adding to your journey because you know, time and money are precious. Powerful. I mean, you decided instead of finding experience in the line of your future, you'd rather fill in the gaps. I mean, you know what you need and you definitely went in for that. I mean, it's been years since that experience. You look back today, do you feel proud about the decision you made? Absolutely, the, hunt, the the right decision to, to, to make. And I think what turned out more fortuitous is where I ended up studying. Um, mm. Because I've heard I've the story many, many times. I had, I'd never heard of INSEAD. And around the time um, I was thinking of going to business school was when I met my husband. And he was studying at the time. Nice. And being somebody who was already doing an MBA, um, he was he had so much you know first hand information of the right places to go to and, and where to to, to um, where how to find the right information so that's how I ended up at NCI because he 
pointed out to me that it was a great school and he thought I was a good fit. I never even heard of the place. Mm. Um, and he was absolutely right. It was the right decision. I, I got so much out of the one year um, at INSEAD, which is uh, which has turned out to um, be to to meet the expectation I had of filling the gaps. Now you fill the gaps with knowledge, but then you have yes. experience to come back. At least in each field, as you're going in, you're credible because people know that you have some baseline knowledge before they give you the job, and then you can you can fill in. And I continue to have an amazing relationship with the school. Um, and last year, I was um, appointed to the board of the school, and that is just such an enormous honor to be asked to join the board um, of the school and to guide the the affairs of the school, I guess, as a, as a board member. Mm. Congrats on that. Thank Let's you. talk a little bit about family, the family Lucy quest. <laughs> Are you a boss at home as well as the office? I mean, just as you're a boss at the office, are you the boss in the house? It's it's interesting. People like to ask that 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 question. Um, first of all, let me take a step to the boss in the workplace. We we I feel that we translate positional power a lot as being a boss. Um, and yes, your job title gives you positional power at your at, in the workplace. But I don't think the modern workplace is constituted of the stereotypical boss-like approach that we think of. I think today to lead in business, if you're the typical old style boss, you will lose people. Not lose them, they will leave the company, but you lose them in the sense that you won't get the best out of them. They will will, will sit back and say, okay, tell us what to do and we'll get it done. So I like to think of myself in the workplace, not so much as a boss. Yes, positional power through, through title, but you use that very carefully and you focus more on um, creating an environment that everyone can thrive in. And some, some people call it that, that the gard, gardener type of leadership where, you know, a gardener goes into a garden and, and you know, nurtures the soil, waters the plants, blah, blah, and creates the right environment for the plants to grow so that everybody can give of their best in the workplace. Um, and I think similarly it, 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 at home, um, I'm very fortunate. I mentioned my husband. We have a, a great relationship where we, we understand each other. We work to, with each other, and we're we're a team. In fact, in fact, sometimes I hear my kids talk about how you know, mommy and daddy are a great team together. Um, so being a team means that each team member knows their their role and responsibility in the team. And of course, as the kids get older, they're also joining the joining the team. And again, it's yeah, about yeah. creating a home environment like you would with the garden, right? Where it's an environment where everybody gets to thrive. Everybody gets to be their, their very, the very best of themselves. It's not about a, a power play or, or, or it's, it's about bringing the best of yourself to the entire family to make it work. So probably a bit similar in terms of my approach in those two areas, but compartmentalized because it's a different environment and you need to know which, in, which nutrients are needed in that using the, the garden analogy. <laughs> I mean, how do you balance them? It, it, it sounds very easy for you, is it? Oh, no, 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 no. It's not? Balance, balance, balance is, um, balance, when you, people ask about balance, it's a constant um, balancing act. Like you're uh-huh. constantly balanced. Uh, look, I like structure, I like routines, but life is real. So you have structures and you have routines. But it doesn't always 100% play out the way and um, way you, you expect. I think now that my children are older, they're the and they're all teenagers. The balancing act is a little easier because they're things that they can do for themselves that they mm-hmm. don't need you for them. But when they were younger, it was actually much harder, and especially during this lockdown. I really empathize with parents of very young children. It's hard for you know, all of us and having to juggle and not, yeah. not having or beyond us. But it's even harder for chill people or, or parents of younger children where you have to do a lot more. So for me, balance also means that over the years, mm-hmm. I've been very open to help and support. And I don't even mean just you know paid help, but where my mother, my sister, family member, my mother in law is willing to step in and help, mm-hmm. um, especially when they were younger, I always say, you know, thank you. I, I don't feel the need to be 
possessive about the entire space. I do try to focus on the priority um, uh, activities that I need to get done. Like you can't leave the raising of your children to someone else. Let's hope that by, by some magic they will be raised. Um, so it's about accepting help, recognizing wh where you're, you're having struggles, recognizing where things are going well, and constantly creating that balance. But as much as possible, having order, having an order in which you do things, mm -hmm. if you have to adjust that order, be flexible, be kind to yourself to, to adjust. Uh, I know that life is real, we're all on a journey, just trying to get through it and make the best impact possible as we try to get through it. Well said. You're welcome to <laughs> mug of, of tea i i like um herbal this is a herbal tea i like herbal, it's herbal tea, tea. A lot. okay uh, it's good uh, it's good for well, our health <laughs> especially in these times some, i had to get some through the camera to you <laughs> just teleport some to me in the studio mm -hmm. lucy let me find out from you how important is family time for you i mean you've told us how the family system works at home how you're able to bring the concept of work i mean how you manage your work to managing your home how important is family time for you um family time is extremely important mm. it's your family is where you kind of recharge your factory whether it's your nuclear family or your extended family but most of us it's, we spend most of our time outside of work with our nuclear family so family time is a, a really really important such a great source of recharging connecting building um, energy and just having uh, you know a place you call home people to connect with um, i wish i spent a lot more family time so i'm not going to pretend um, that um, it's all um, perfect and I, it's always enough family time i'd love to have a whole lot more but we all have things we need to do um, and yeah. some work can make it almost impossible to have good quality family time um or always or or, or 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 consistently so i always like to you know, remind myself and reset i love it when i can be off work completely so i can you know focus a bit a bit there or when we can go places together or just be in the same location so it's the volume the amount of family time varies but i always try to bring myself back to it, it's a priority so let's make time for it let's make time to connect let's make time to talk and sometimes it doesn't have to be a big deal it's, it's Sitting together, yeah. having that meal, and not rushing off after that meal to the response to the email, but sitting there and having a chat, right? And the chat can go in any direction. You don't have to premeditate the chat. That's a great thing about yeah. family time. Just talking. Um, and you can't program we, them. You can't program it. You just relax and have a chat and, and just, you know, oh, so what do you think about this? And, and I, I, you know, it's amazing, <clears throat> excuse me, the things you can learn as well in family time. Mm. Young mm. people are so full of ideas so full of opinions that you, mm. you, you may not have, but through the, the lens of their opinion, you see things from a completely different uh, perspective and expand your understanding. I mean, it, 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 family time is the best time, absolutely. Wow. You mentioned one thing that caught my attention, spending family time with your family and the benefits. I mean, you pick ideas, the different points of view you get from things that are happening in your life. Mm. I want to know, how much do your kids know about your work life? I mean, do they know what your work entails? If you ever miss family time, do they understand you? How is it like at home? Um, interesting question. I'm reflecting. I, I, I don't think they fully understand my work. Of course, you don't want to burden your, your children with the details of your work and come home every day and talk about this, that, and the other, as you would with, say, your spouse, that's different. Um, but I, I think over time, they're kind of understanding a little bit about the responsibility and the time it takes away from us all being in the same place um, or uh, um, more often. But not to the extent of understanding what it entails. What they understand is that it's very time consuming um, and, and there's a lot of responsibility, um, but not the detail of it, and which, which I, I completely understand because when you're younger, mm -hmm. work is a mystery, right? What do they go and do all day? I, I remember working from home once many years ago and being on lots of calls and one of my kids saying to me, 
So is that what you do? You go to work and you just spend the day talking to these people. <laughs> and I was like, no, but I'm not there. So yes, so, well, knowing yes, because we're talking, but we're talking to you know, either solve an issue, discuss an issue, or figure out what to go and do next. But not all the time is spent talking, but it's so nice to see that fresh perspective from a child's point of view of it boiling down to that. He's just talking, talking, talking to me. I've just seen you talk on the phone. <laughs> Oh, um, yes, yeah, so I think the in-depth understanding, not not there, but the fact that it's responsibility and time-consuming, I think that, uh, that is there. Final question of family. We, we mentioned earlier that kids cannot be programmed. I mean, you just do your best as a parent and then watch the rest just flow. But as a parent, as a good mom, what are the values you try to impart to your kids? I mean, what are the things you hope and constantly work towards instilling in their lives how do you want to see them grow mm. or what do you want to see them grow into i think for us the the overarching value system and theme is is the fact that we're christian families so number one is christian values um and and in summing up those christian values maybe i can use like um, two commands to, to highlight the sum of those Christian values. And it was the two commands of Jesus. One is about you love, love the Lord your God with all your heart and, and all your being. And the other was love, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, it's easy to have those two and make them almost into a, a strap line. But in more and a more direct response to your question, what does that actually mean? And I think what it means is that, you know, you have to do the right thing. You have to have integrity. You have to have um, value your own potential and your capability. Be in tune with the fact that you also have something to offer that is very, 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 very So I, I, it's very important to me that the value system revolves around the example we set. So it's not just about telling them how we want them to be, but living out how we want them to be. And that even includes things like this. I'm not, I'm not pretending that I get every single thing right with them. Yeah, yeah. It's important to be able to connect and listen to their feedback, which I do a lot. And if I get something wrong, I will, I will actually engage them to, 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 to correct it, apologize if I need to, because I also want them to know that as you grow up as an individual, if you get something wrong, learn the ability to listen to people, to communicate, um, to... Um, to communicate, to um, engage and, and do the right things. Um, uh, so, um, but what happens, and I, I, I think I want to add, add this little explanation, um, is that how you execute that, I believe, varies with age. When people are very little, there's no point giving them a lecture about communication. I mean, if someone is old, what does that mean? A five-year-old is a five-year-old, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so for instance, uh, when they were really little, and, and because one of the things I wanted them to be able to do was um, communicate and and uh, and pre present themselves, we used to have this exercise we do um, on on a Friday. So the Friday is just us sitting there, and we yeah. have presentation. And each one had to get up, stand in front of us. This is only like a couple of minutes. <laughs> get up, introduce themselves and say to them, my name is so-and-so. I go to you know, school here. And uh, then they had to tell us what they had done that week. And obviously, they're not doing a PowerPoint or they're not writing it down because they're so nah. little. But they're just that opportunity to stand up in front of your family and say, this is why I've started building you the notion that... Um, I can go out there and talk to people more broadly. You know, so that's a simplified example of the way you do it with a very young child. You know, whereas when they're older, I remember being older and, and having conversations around um, if something went wrong and something went wrong in school and the focus being on the integrity, you know, how that behavior. So if someone cheated on a test, the conversation we would have is not so much about the fact that um, the person cheated, but the, it's it's the value system that that demonstrated and why it was wrong. Cheating that's is that's wrong. very true. It's the integrity. The lack of integrity is the message I want them to get from our conversation. Again, this question ties in very nicely with your point about family time. 
because a lot of this can't be prescriptive like we're in a classroom we're not it's not classroom no. the student relationship where you come with the formula and you show them the formula it's an ongoing conversation and discussion around trans you know, sharing those values but also using real life experiences that you're all going through to live the examples and and demonstrate and show them so it's a journey and it's a process and you evolve with it honestly if i'm to give you max for this answer i would have given you 130% <laughs> that's a good job shouts going out to look man evergreen mumin is watching us on our uh, Facebook, Fafa is also logged in, Manasseh Kwafo, Brands for Noah Deborah, Junior, and then Camille Salas Jara. Guys, you can also join in the conversation by WhatsApp 0202 On Twitter, the hashtag is Wiley Debot Series. Get on our Facebook, Y1079 FM. You can watch the interview live there as well. Lucy, let's talk about your career. I mean, you started professionally as an electrical and electronic engineer for the Ford Motor Company, where you attained your chartered engineer certificate. Tell us a bit about your career path from Ford to moving into the telco industry and then where you are now. Um, okay. So I joined Ford um, as, as a young person. Actually, when I went out, I, I, you, you talk about leaving Ghana. Mm -hmm. When I left um, Ghana, um, I joined Ford as as a student. Oh, I just found you. Look, I just found you here. I'm gonna I'm gonna share it so that people on my Great. page can, um, are chat as well. Um, I hope I've got the right one. I think so. I can see someone with a box. Is there someone with a box near you? This is a live <laughs> conversation, <laughs> right? Is there someone with a box next next to you? Oh no, that's uh, an old conversation. Okay, that's yes, fine. Yes, that's an old conversation. Let me quickly share this on my page in case somebody. Um, uh, yes, there we go. Right. So let me share this. All right. On my, um, so that other people can join us in case. Um, uh, oh, gosh. Wait, where's the speed when you need it? <laughs> <laughs> Where is the speed? Please bear with me. Please bear with me. No, it's fine. Um, it's fine. Take your time. Take your time. Yes. Ah, um, hang on. Did you find it? I found one place to share. Let me see. I've done one. Share, share to. Uh, I'm trying to do share to a page, but it's not working. Is it sense? So it's not working. Yeah, share. To, I've shared it to a story, but I'm sharing it to. Um, hmm. If you can share with Emma, I think she would. I think I have managed to share. Let me see. Okay, I've shared it to us, my story, my page story. So hopefully people can see okay. this. Sorry. Okay, um, sure. please. Hello, come again. Please repeat the question. I said, so tell us a bit about your career path ah, from yes. Ford. Yes, to moving into telco and then yeah. where you are now. Yeah. Um, so I joined Ford, um, as, as a 19 year old, I talked about, we talked about the fact that I'd gone from the UK to Ghana. I joined Ford yeah. as a 19 year old, I was already working in manufacturing, even before I went to university. So it, it kind of it meant that as I studied engineering, I was actually working in engineering in tandem, um, which meant that by the time I graduated, I had a significant amount of experience, um, already. Um, and, and, and then I carried on working there for a number of years after that. So that, I think that 10 year period really gave me the practical experience of executing as an engineer, not just sort of theoretically, but really how do you actually make things solve problems? In my case, build new circuits, new build, build circuits, build new production lines, so on and so forth. Um, so we talked about that. Then we talked about the fact that after Ford, I went to um, business school and I've explained why I went to business yeah. school. Um, while I was at business school, my, my biggest burning desire at the time was to move back to, um, to be honest, at that time, I said Africa, not necessarily Ghana. I was open to working uh, anywhere, okay. any country. Uh, my mantra was any country that would take me, I'll go. 
<laughs> so um, I started looking really hard for, for a job on the continent. If you told me that there was some okay. job somewhere in South Africa, I'd take the number, call the person Ooh, immediately, God. you know, trying to reach out to everybody. But I guess mm. it wasn't to be at the time. So between mm-hmm. me wanting to move um, to work on the continent, to actually working, um, it, took, it, it was a four-year period, four, three to four-year period before it actually materialized. Um, and in between, you know, I finished my course and then I went to work for um, the Royal Bank of Scotland. Um, at the time, the Royal Bank of Scotland was uh, transforming their business post a major merger they had done. And then later, uh, we transitioned to transitioned into being part of the um, acquisition team because then they bought another bank and um, we had to merge the business. So it was really bringing some of that business acumen and engineering problem solving together um, to work at the Royal Bank of Scotland. So I did that for um, a couple of years and then I got this great opportunity to join the telecoms industry um, on the continent. So, you know, it, it, it took a bit of a, a leap because when you're making any major change, and remember by this time, I'm not making, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the change as an individual. We, we talked about many yeah. changes going forward yeah. as, as a person. But suddenly you're doing this later in life as a family. It's it's, it's a big decision, a big choice to make. Um, but by God's grace, it's worked out well. By came to work on, on the continent, I think telecoms was a great big fit for me. So I had uh, no experience in telecoms, even though she says it's a great fit. But yeah. I had studied electrical and electronic engineering. And I, interestingly, in my final year, when I we had to kind of choose an area of, of focus, I had focused in what back then we call communications, which really turned out to be telecommunications. So you learn about, you know, transmission, you learn about um, uh, wide area networks, things that are relevant to the telecom industry I I had learned about. And of course, I'd done all this in business. So it was a good fit in terms of my my background, even though I had no experience. Um, And I was just grateful to have the opportunity to step into an industry that was relevant to the continent, um, mm. but also give the opportunity to be on the continent. Mm. And my first role in telecoms was in, in business development. So I was actually supporting that company in, in driving their business across the continent, different countries, um, uh, which meant that I also got the opportunity to use my, my French speaking skills. I love French as a language. Um, it's mm. one of the... Uh, is I learned later. I learned French much later. By the time I learned French, I, I had learned uh, English, da, and chi. So then I added wow. French. I think it was fair to add another another one later, like focus <laughs> on that. Um, but that was also relevant to, to that job because the company had business in both um, Anglophone and Francophone African countries. So it meant that when I went into a market, I could you know, engage and connect with the staff and, and customers. Um, so I, I did. I, so, so I've had many roles in, in telecoms whether it's around Mm -hmm. development, leading enterprise business, chief marketing officer. It's just been a number of roles in telecoms, which I I felt that gave me me the opportunity to fully solve uh, the previous problem I said I had, right? I said, I didn't know how the marketing worked. I didn't know how this worked. I didn't know how I had knowledge. So working in telecoms the way I did meant that I I managed to gain the practical experience to build on the the foundation of the knowledge that mm-hmm. I found in my MBA. So very fortuitous. Um, and then eventually I ended up um, you know, becoming a, a telecom CEO, which is, a, to me, a translation of that early, early ambition. Yeah. Of, of course, by this time, I had developed better language as an adult and I knew what I actually meant for CEO, but mm-hmm. back as a child, I didn't know. And then you start to know. build, communicate, with your management, with your leaders to say, this is where I want my career to go. To um, go. And, and I encourage people to, when you have that, when you have a goal, find the right people to share with. You don't have to go around telling the whole world, I want to do this, I want to become this, blah, blah, mm. blah. You have to really see yourself in, in that that vision of your future. I remember saying this at Ashesi University that you know, I, I, I kind of boiled it down to imagining wanting to, to be um, a, a uh, I see you, but really what, what I'm talking about is the fact that you want to have a vision of the future mm-hmm. and then tell the right people, not everyone, the right people who can help you get there. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't necessarily mean 
they'll give you the job or get you the job or facilitate the job. Sometimes helping simply means them telling you the things you need to work on to That's prepare true. for that, right? Because the fact that you want something or you want to become something doesn't always mean that you're ready or prepared for it. But if it's really where you go, then again, back to my thought, my ideas around gap analysis, what are the skills I need to build to get there? Um, so I think by the time the opportunity came around, I was prepared because many people had invested in preparing me for that opportunity, even though we didn't mm. know where the opportunity was going to come from. Um, we knew in anticipation of it coming, people had helped yeah. me and me and coached me and guided me and given me opportunities that build the right um, business skills uh, and leadership skills that would help me get into, into that role. Um, and, and, and of course, it's, it was an opportunity of a lifetime to run a telecom company. To um, um, it, It's interesting because a lot of the time the conversation focuses around um, being the first woman to run a telecom company. But but interestingly, believe it or not, when I knew I was going to take the job, what was foremost in my mind was not my gender at all. And I okay. think that's a, a byproduct of my socialization because I'd been you know, raised and not to always think woman, girl, 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 yeah, woman, woman. Yeah. I was more concerned that people would say that um, I wasn't old enough. Like I didn't have enough gray hair. I didn't have, mm -hmm. you know, that was my concern. That's the tradition <laughs> here. You know, and I thought you're gonna say, "Oh, you know, what does she know? She's so young." And you know, you always have, always have to remind yourself why you're ready for this, what you've done, and how you've been prepared for this over, over the years. Mm, mm, mm. Um, but it turned out that when it actually came um, to be, people were more interested in the fact that I was a woman than um, my age. So I guess, yeah, it's different. It goes to show you how. Sometimes what you think the situation is or the things that we, 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 we prioritize as worries are not things we should worry about at all. And, and you know, in reality, when I say people talked about my gender, it's not as though it translated into people holding me back. It just meant that people were just more um, interested in the fact that a woman was taking the job than they were my age. And, and that's fine. Um, and we had a, a really good three, three and a half years there and we drove the business and most many people have experienced the business for themselves. So um, I won't go on about that. But since then, I mean, I think there have been another, a number of other things that I've had the opportunity to be part of. Everybody knows about me um, in football. So we don't. Yes, I, we're going to get to that in a bit. <laughs> um, and now I work in financial services. So that's kind uh -huh. of the run through of, of mm. the career as you asked for. Mm. Wow. One thing I pick from all these experiences you're sharing with us today is the fact that as a human being, as an individual, you don't cease learning new things. Mm. Do not hesitate to apply what you need to make yourself a better version of yourself. And when that change comes in, do not say no to the change that comes from your environment. So, I mean, when you study new things, you might be moved into new fields where your capabilities might be needed. You don't say no. You move with it. If you need more in order to fit well and be extra capable where you are, you learn it too. I really love that, I should say. Thank you. Now, along the way, well, let me just touch on Telco once again. You mentioned that you were the first CEO, lady CEO, woman CEO, female CEO of a telco company here. And it's in your Instagram bio. That's how proud you are of it. Aside that, what were the other things or what were some of your proudest achievements throughout your career in Ghana as the telco CEO, you working in the financial, you know, industry, all that. What were some of the other proudest moments? Um, wow. Uh, I think one of one of my proudest moments was um, one of the when I worked for one of the previous companies, and we actually built 
I led a project where we we, we built um, connectivity. So as, as a project lead, we work closely with the engineering team um, to build fiber connectivity between Ghana, Togo, and um, Kina Faso, which was, um, I guess, a great feat for us as a, as a company because it meant that suddenly these three con con countries could connect directly um, via fiber. Now, this involved, of course, engaging their ministries. So you don't, build, you don't connect your fiber to another country without going to speak to their ministry of, of communication and their minister and their regulator and so on. So the, the background to that was you're me going to Ouagadougou to meet, meet the right people, <clears throat> speaking to people in Togo and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so the fact that we could work across countries in a very uh, sort of Pan-African way uh, in two languages, because our, our team spoke English and their teams spoke um, French, finding the right resources to make sure that the work could, could go on and they could even tr do things like translating this, the specifications that they were working um, the working because uh, Anglophone countries tend to use more British specs in engineering and Francophone countries tend to use more mm -hmm. French uh, in engineering and they're not exactly the same. So there's always yeah. that work of and, 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 and connecting as teams. So I think that I was very proud that this connectivity was actually a really big deal for, for the region. Um, so what else is a, is, is a moment? I think the other things that come to mind is not so much the moments, but more the number of people that I have worked with, I had the privilege of working with, who have gone on to do some really, really um, amazing things in their careers and in their own right. I think that definitely um, is something I'm very proud of. I'm very proud that we, we managed to grow together and to build our careers so that the time that we had together wasn't the, the beginning and wasn't the end, uh, and the be over was just the beginning of more things to come in the future. I think I'm, I'm most proud of that, the fact that through working together, we, we all get to grow. Mm. Along the way, you founded Quest Blue Diamond. What I want to find out uh, is how unique were the solutions it sought to offer back then? I mean, I learned it was aimed at plugging a particular hole in the system. I want to find out which gap that initiative was meant to fill and what were the things it was set out to offer service-wise. Yeah. Um, so our primary obje objective was, um, you know, creating a, a marketplace where people could really um, sell their products, which we, we started actually um, in 2018, early 2018. We went live in 2019 last year. Um, and, and in terms of running a business, of course, it was an early stage business. It is an early stage business. Mm -hmm. And also it's an early stage business. We're growing it. And I think the, the fact that we were able to create the product, which was mainly our marketplace, um, a few shops online, um, all locally. I always, I'm really, really proud and emphatic when we use our own skills and know-how to create locally. Yeah. I think it's really important that we create opportunities for our own local people to to, to create and use their ingenuity. So for, for me, that's a sense of source of pride. The other thing that I'm really proud of is the fact that our focus was it is on locally produced goods. Now, I do have to add that because of the pandemic, we've had to put um, our operations on hold in that regard. But the specific um, hold that you're referring to that we're, we're, we're plugging is that um, the, when, when you have um, producers and consumers, right, you want to create efficient pathways to connecting them to, to matching their supply and their demand. Um, and That's true. We're not quite there yet as a country and, and broadly across the continent and how we do this efficiently. We have solutions where we meet, we, we match supply and demand, don't get me wrong, but we still have very high search costs. So let me bring that, let me go, come out of economic speak into everyday speak. What I mean by high search, search costs is that if you're looking for a particular good or item in Accra, as an example, 
it's not always easy to know exactly where you're going to find it from. Sometimes yes. it becomes a case of, oh, I'm looking for such and such. Then you ask a friend and the friend asks a friend. That's all very inefficient and very high search mm -hmm. cost. And imagine we're having this conversation about Sakra. What's happening in other areas, not even in the cities, in that town that is beyond um, um, Kumasi, in in, 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 in Seshuyo, so in different places. So we have a lot of work to do across the country and it still remains work to be done because we didn't, our solution didn't cover everything. And as I said, we've had to put it on, on hold due to the pandemic that we need to address. How do we reduce search costs? How do we make the um the need to find goods and services how do we fulfill the need for goods and services more efficiently than we currently do and efficiency obviously not only um creates value but it gives people time back that they can be spending doing other things so there are all kinds of you know um drivers to the to the need of efficiently match, matching supply and demand and that was the whole we were um, um focused on on plugging wow that's a good one you also co-founded Fresh Pay in the Democratic Republic of Congo, right? Yeah, with a couple of uh, friends, yes. Great. How has that initiative impacted on the e-payment system across the geographic locations it's been used in? I mean, where it's being used, how has the impact been? Um, I'm, I, I have to admit that I'm not um, um, impact, involved in it from a sort of day-to-day is I know that as a, as a country, their financial, um, their digital payments like we do in Ghana are not as mature, right? So, you know, uh, they're probably where we were a few years ago with mobile money and things like that, where the, um, where the, the, the payments are relatively limited and the usage is limited. But look, I think what the, 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 they're doing well is focusing on being positioned from when, for when the market truly picks up. And, and it, yeah, it's an important point to share because I think sometimes business opportunity is about positioning. It's about mm -hmm. being um, prepared for when things do pick up. Um, and, and in their case, they're very much focused on um, the, creating the, the matching system that works between various operators and banks so i think yes. once the market starts to pick up i think that things will go very very well for them um, there are examples across the continent where this sort of solution has worked very well um, and, in, and sometimes we have to try different solutions to eventually find the ones that will really work in a, in a particular mm. market sounds good now, in addition to your advocacy for technology or technological innovation, you're a firm believer in uh, empowering young girls to cultivate an interest in STEM. I mean, science, technology, engineering, and math, especially whilst in education. Tell us a bit about how you arrived at this point and some of the things that you're doing currently or you've done to make this happen. Look, I think we are a, a country and continent in transition. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of outstanding problems to solve. And I recognize that just copying and pasting solutions doesn't work because, well, some, occasionally it works, but in general, it doesn't work because it misses the understanding of the context, mm. right? So to give a concrete example, we just talked about mobile payments. Mobile money, as we know it, is an African invention, right? Yes. And it was African response to customer behavior. You know, the, 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 the people who may not be as familiar, the genesis is the fact that in countries like Ghana and a few other countries, people were using airtime as a proxy for cash, right? That's so true. send them credits, as we call it, yeah, and then they go to the vendor and exchange the credit for money by doing credit transfer and pay a margin, usually a high margin of like 10% at least. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's how the product the, uh, innovation came about. And the rest, there's a lot that goes into making a product um, successful, but that's where the insight came from and, and, and and drove it. So 
why do I use this example? This is a very, very specific solution to our needs on the continent, right? Which has now gone on and influenced the rest of the world as far as uh, payments uh, are concerned. Um, so I know that we need to find very contextual solutions to some of our challenges. Mm. And a STEM background, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, typically gives you many of the tools you need to solve problems. Now, let me add a caveat here because I hear this from people all the time. All the time. I'm not saying other careers and other professions are not important. So let me put that on the table. But every career and every profession uh, and every um, approach to um, um, working mm -hmm. plays a specific role. And we have a very big gap when it comes to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. That, so one is the gap. Two is the fact that, of course, those are the fields in which I, 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 I work professionally. So, of course, I have a natural bias in terms of understanding. I can't read the law to you. I, I'm not a lawyer. So yeah. I don't know if but I don't pretend to. Um, so we, we recognize that we have problems to solve and we recognize that actually, when you, whether you're talking about industrialization, whatever it is we need to do in the, the, the quantum uh, future, whatever we need to do, or, or the development that we see in other parts of the world and we call them developed, is predicated on a foundation of science, technology, and engineering and mathematics. Mm -hmm. Whether it's better healthcare, whether it's better education solutions, whether it's uh, about uh, building infrastructure, whatever it is, is built on STEM. So that's why we need more young people in general mm. to, to go into STEM fields. Now, the pe educationists who are listening to me probably have better figures than I, than I do. Um, but I do know that Ghana, the, the percentage of young people who um, graduate in STEM fields, if I'm not mistaken, every year is, um, I think it's less than 10%. It's a small percentage. And the number of girls in that percentage is even lower. Is so lower? When, yeah, even lower. So if you look at the entire population of young people, we need to encourage mm -hmm. more of them, them if we're going to solve our problems, right? Let's recognize that the goal is we need to solve problems. And mm -hmm. in that, we can't have leave the girls behind. So I advocate for young people in general to participate more in STEM because we need more problem solvers. And I anticipate, I, I, I advocate for girls um, because they're, we, we are women, girls, female, we're part of the population. We can't be left out of solving our problems, right? So we need to participate as well and we need to be encouraged to be in there. So it, you know, we're half the population. If it's only a tiny percentage of us are in STEM fields to influence the conversation that's being had mm -hmm, or the solutions mm -hmm. that are being thought of, then that perspective will be completely missed in creating solutions, right? Wow. And I give you a, a really simple example. When I worked um, in the automotive industry, my company went to great lengths, right, to keep us female engineers in engineering. Like they really created a supportive environment. And one of the insights they had was that, that for most families, at least in their environment, when a car was being purchased, even though a lot of the time, um, the person who made the payment for the car was typically maybe um, the, the husband, the person who typically decided which car to buy was actually the wife. Was, yes. Because most of the time, it's the wife who spends a lot of her time in the car, whether it's taking the kids' places, various various um, you know um, errands she had to run. So if she didn't like your car, then the family won't buy your car. That's true. Which means that going back to your design phase, if you do not have people in your teams who understand the perspective of, of, of the, the woman who's going to be the decision maker in the purchase of your car, then you're not going to design a product that, 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 that your customer, your ultimate customer really wants. So you see where the insight comes into it. So there's so few women in the organization that they had to work really hard to keep us there, to keep us engaged there. So we would stay and we would influence the designs that came out. So it's a very you know, simple example from business, but I think it applies to all the solutions we need to create in our own environment. But we need a balanced view need diverse opinions, diverse approaches to be involved in creating those solutions to make them as sustainable as possible for our society and for all of our communities.
I'll tell you what, whoever misses this interview has really done themselves a lot of that. Wow. This, this feels, <laughs> it feels almost as if it's uh, TEDx 2.0, you know, <laughs> fast this morning. Moving on, yeah, you that's... once told BBC's Women of Africa that your aim isn't about a single trial blazing woman, but rather a highway of uh, women doing what they need to get done. How yeah. instructive is this for the successful woman leader or women leaders? Yeah, you look, when I said that on the BBC interview, I meant every word of it. The thing about it is that, and I talk about it in a different way in my book, that it's good to celebrate the individual success, but the success of the individual is not enough. We're on a continent of 1.2 billion people. Yeah. If we're still at a stage where we can still count the number of women who have done this and the number of people who have done that, and then, then we have a big problem because it, it means that we're still at that stage of um, growth where we haven't hit a critical mass for these things to become normal. So that's true. It's, look, I, I, I applaud everyone who um, is blazing a trail, creating a new path for us. I really genuinely applaud them. Um, but I think our ultimate goal has to be that you don't remain, quote unquote, the special one. And rather, whatever you did becomes the norm that we can, we get past that and actually build on to the next stage and the next stage and the next stage. That's why I, I talked about a highway. What I would love rather is it is for it to be so normal as not even a conversation piece. Oh, so-and-so became the CEO of this or so-and-so became the boss of this. And it's like, oh, okay, congratulations, applause. But we're not like, oh my goodness, how did that happen? That's what I uh, meant by that. By, by creating a highway of successful um, people and, and the example you use women, then that highway becomes Multi, it has a multiplier effect. It becomes that we have so many leaders that people can turn to, that people can seek guidance from, who can help us make the right decisions, who can bring their experience to play. It means we're making progress. A high way of successful women means that we're making progress. Now, look, the journey, I think I've tried to elaborate a little bit, is not um, easy. But it's not easy because it's not uneasy because you're a woman. It's not uneasy because you're Ghanaian. It's not uneasy because you're African. It's uneasy because trying to achieve anything in life is challenging. That's true. Like, like anything you want to do in life, has tried. yes, in some contexts, some challenges may play up more than others. I get all of that. But don't, don't make it just about your environment and your context or you. The fact of the matter is that we're on a planet where... Um, um, uh, we, we need as a continent to pull ourselves through. We need to pull ourselves up. We need more people achieve and we need to support each other. We, we have so much to do to bring the level of our daily existence on average to a point where we all have a genuine opportunity. Yes, yes, by. yes. So we need to many, we need many people. We don't only need stars or individuals. We need many people and you know i i had a quote that i really um, like i heard from a lady called um chinwe esmai um, okay. a lady um friend of mine and i think it was a brilliant quote she was on a panel um and um and she said there's no point in being the first if you're going to be the last mm. there's no point being the first if you're going to be the last yes you can't be wow. the one and only because then if you're gone, you leave with it. Right. I remember at a point growing up, there was news about an unfortunate accident that took the lives of back then Ghana's few heart surgeons. And the country was really hit by this news. And what you're saying is really drawing my mind back to that. I mean, the impact was super huge because there were the few people doing that. And so it means in moving forward, in changing our continent, in drawing us closer to the ideal development we want to get into, we shouldn't strive, you know, for or try to become in the first of the first and last of whatever it is that we want to become. But I mean, try to be a part of a whole bunch 
doing the same Ex thing. Exactly. You know, mm. don't get stuck in the 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 you know the, the pride of all. It's it's just you know how are you going to make sure that there's a whole group of people coming up behind you who not only not who are not following you, they're actually going to get past you and do much more than you have. Um, ever been able to think of that's how we make progress and we can't it, while we can still count things individually we should be concerned the ability to count the number of surgeons the ability to count the number of urologists the ability to count account, uh, count the number of uh, phds in mathematics we're still in that stage even our phds in mathematics mm. we can count them and yet i visited one um um a business I remember about two years ago, I was blown away. This is a business here, and I went to I went there to learn as I was working on um, Chris Blue Diamond and uh, 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 a luxury luxury brand matching company where they they match luxury products from anywhere in the world to the buyer. And I sat and I listened to this company, and they had sixty data scientists, sixty one company. And when they say data science, they're talking about people who have PhDs in data science. They had 60. Mm -hmm. And I sat there in that room and I thought, oh my goodness, but the whole country in Ghana, how many data scientists do we have? How many people do we have crunching our numbers, helping us make more effective decisions? And this company alone had 60. Mm. So think of disparity. One com company has 60 to make them help them make more efficient decisions, make money, help their business grow, improve their business model real time, quick, 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 quick. Look, I don't know the figure, but I think it's safe to say that I doubt we have 60 data scientists. I've asked a few people. I'm actually thinking about it. And people, some people have really even given me close to it, like nothing. But I, I, I'd like to believe that that's not true. It's not that we have none. It's just that I don't know them. But the point is that as a country, who are the people in the room crunching our numbers? Mm. Even when you're writing a policy document, you have to write a policy based on um, data points that have been analyzed and inferences have been drawn. So going back to my point about STEM and about making sure that we have many people doing things, the challenges we have are not about just one or two um, bright. Mm. It is about creating en masse people who can solve problems, make decisions, who can work, who can execute, who can deliver. We have to do this at scale. Mm -hmm. It's really, you know, sometimes we talk about development, we boil it down to whether it's politics or a few, a handful yeah. of, there's none of, you can't, it's just physically impossible to solve for 30 million people with a few hundred people who have, who have very specific skill sets and are all, all day, you know, focused on other things, um, whether it's legislature, whether it's keeping the country safe, which are relevant. But we, as the citizens of a country, need to recognize that actually to move forward, we're all going to have to get in there. We're all going to have to do the work. We're all going to have to build ourselves up as individuals with skills and knowledge that are relevant to the, to the country's agenda and work together to actually deliver. You spent quite a number of years in Ghana. In the beginning of the interview, we talked about your experience in senior high school. I remember you didn't want to touch on facilities that aided education and all that. We're speaking about STEM. Do you think as a nation, we've done enough to nurture more young people getting into STEM? Do we have uh, enough? We, we, we don't. We don't have enough, right? Um, so we have some facilities, some schools are equipped, and I keep using the word some because we do need to get to a point where every child who wants to has the access. Yes. So for instance, and we, I, the fact is we, we're not at that stage. We're not at the stage where every child who wants access to the equipment that they need to build um, um, their the, the STEM foundation has access it's why i admire companies like you know dex technologies so dex technologies i've known them for many years mm. and with this innovation which is a science set Ghanaian company young guy charles antipem mm. um and they came up with this uh, science set where it's like the, the basics when i first met them actually it was about basic circuitry where you had the resistors and the wires and so on so i'm speaking electrical engineering yeah, yeah. now um 
to build a circuit and you could actually see how circuits actually work. They've actually, they've evolved now. And now I know they have kits that even include building um, robots at home, right? So what they're doing is trying to democratize access to STEM education um, because yeah, one of the founders, his experience was growing up as a child, he didn't always have access to these, these materials. So we do have work to do. One of my key drivers in going mm. to Prosec at the time was that Prosec had had a um, huge new investment and had built a you know, you know, state-of-the-art science facilities. So I knew that going there as a sixth former, I would have access to the labs that I needed, whether it's in physics, whether it's yeah. in chemistry, whatever I was doing. But it has to be that it's not only a few or some children who have access to these, these things. We need to be able That's to true. provide across the country, um, which means that there are a number of things which we I won't, we don't have to elaborate on this in this conversation. But so many things have to be brought to bear to make sure that we we, we provide access across the, the country just because we believe that a great foundation is the right of every child in our country. Wow. Because of time constraints, let's just move it real quick. Let's talk about your book. I'm now going to talk to the Lucy Quist, the author. Super, <laughs> super interested in that. Hey, the book just had to come in there. So I have one, but I would need another one that is specially signed for my library. Because okay. it's a book I'd like to pass on to my kids. I'd like Thank to you. pass on to my guests. Whoever enters my library should read that book. Tell us briefly about the journey to writing the bold new normal. What led to the decision to write the book? And what is the quick story behind the book's title itself? Um, so the story behind the bold new normal, you know, for, for quite some time, I've told people how it was as a result of people reaching out to me. So when I, when I first moved, you know, moved into, um, year on 2014 I had a lot of people reaching out to me and connecting and wanting mentoring guidance and and insights and, and thoughts and because I, I I didn't have the physical capacity to speak to everyone I decided to use social media as a vehicle to yep. connect so that's how I started writing is really through social media um, and as I wrote and connected and people gave me feedback my writing was really based on experience so it wasn't just sort of I have an idea so I write about it I would reflect on an experience and translate that into a lesson I learned out of it. And that's how we engaged in the conversation. And, and that was, you know, that I started that end of 2014. So it was December 2014 when my, my Facebook page actually went up. And over the time, the writing back and forth, back and forth, um, I, I learned, but I learned um, that perhaps there was more people wanted to hear. But then I started getting people directly saying to me, mm -hmm. you should write, a book. we need to hear all of this in one place. Like you need to write a book. Now, what's interesting is that I've subsequently gone back to some of my old notebooks and realized mm -hmm. that prior to that I'd written, cause I like to write goals and sometimes the goals will happen 10 years later, but it's okay, it's a goal. And then I come back and I find that it's happened, yay. Um, and I'd written about wanting to write a book, but the early times, that I'd written that I'd wanted to write a book. I had no idea what I wanted to write mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. I just knew at the time that I wasn't keen on writing about myself. I wasn't really interested in a book that was about me. So I needed something else to write about. And of course, this mm -hmm. came into being. Um, in 2016, I was invited to do a TED talk, a TEDx talk. And I, I thought, mm -hmm. okay, this is TEDx. This is a big platform. This is TEDx Houston, which is based in London. This is 18 minutes to tell the world what you're really, really thinking, what's really on your mind. And I dug really deep and I focused on my, my true passion, which is about um, creating a prosperous Africa. Um, yep. And it took us going back and forth and um, in terms of thinking of the content. And then I came up with the title, um, The New Normal. And then as we went through um, the, the, the prep and so on, it became obvious that what I was anticipating was more something more bold than just a new normal. And so that's how the bold came to it. So we, I landed on the bold new normal and that was the title of my, my TEDx talk in 2016. Mm. So at this, at this stage, I still didn't have a book. In fact, I didn't write the book until 2018. So the book itself yeah. was, the writing process was two years later. 
and the launch wasn't until 2019. Um, so why do I share this kind of um, slightly long-winded journey? Well, not we're not long-winded in terms of my delivery, but long-winded mm -hmm. in terms of the mm -hmm. years it took. Because it's a process. We have to develop the muscle on our continent that says that things take time. Things require effort. Delivery of, of you know, what we want to be could take us 10 years. It could take longer to get there. But let's invest the time and effort it takes to actually get there because that's what the continent needs from us. Um, but so that's how the book came into being. Great. So one thing or the first thing I picked from reading the book was the fact that you preached that instead of following or living by the gospel of simply surviving as Africans, we should shift our mindset from surviving to actually prospering. Prosperity instead of survival. Tell me more about this. I mean, in our normal lives, in our lives as Africans, why? Because right. I want to survive. Yeah. So, so look, I use the term African and African very loosely because I absolutely re respect the fact that we're 1.2 billion um, people, we're so many different countries. People are at different um, stages economically and, and enjoy different you know, benefits. But if I think, if I generalize a little bit, in comparison to the, West of, the rest of the world, we are behind now. At the time that I wrote the book, and I don't believe this has changed because we looked at the 20, we actually looked at the 2020 or 2021 projection of, of um, um, GDP, and it was the same as the back then. But if, I, if I'm not mistaken, Africa is about 14% of the world's population, and yet our GDP contribution is valued at, I think it's 3.2 or 3.5%. I capture it in the book. So think about it. The 14% of you sharing a little over 3% of the pie yes. of the economic. So if we're sharing equally, it means that 14% of you, and you see my STEM always comes to, now I've moved into math mode. I've moved from <laughs> engineering to mathematics. So it means that that 14% yeah. of you enjoying 3 point something percent of the spoils of the, of uh -huh. the world's you know, economic growth, it invariably means that you, you are getting less than the rest of the world mm -hmm. on average. Or to put it another way, the 3.4 uh, or 3.5% GDP of global scale is actually the GDP of some individual country, their contribution to the whole So some countries whose population is counted in millions and not billions have a GDP contribution to the world that is valued the same as the entire continent of Africa. So that's looking at it in a global perspective. Bringing it down, we're surviving life because look, we're, we're, most Africans are just trying to get through. Like it, you know, when, it, when, the, when the average person is born, they still face a lot of risk as far as, as, far as healthcare is concerned on the mm -hmm. continent, mm -hmm. which can be the case. We need to be a continent where people have access to healthcare, that is right for them. Then we have the, the challenge of education, right? So it's not just about um, attending, but the quality of education broadly across um, the continent, we need to improve that. Then if they survive this, because bear in mind, we have a large proportion of very young African children that still die in childhood. Um, I think the last time I checked, the figure was double digits, which is too high. Then you have getting through school, so making it all the way through to the end and not dropping out, and a lot of the drop, dropping out is because of one had an, a goal to become a professional. Everybody was focused on the uh, unskilled or semi-skilled jobs. So that should tell you something about the way we, we, we're socializing and thinking. And then after they get through all of this, there's a question of will they even get a job? We still have a large pr proportion of our young people who remain un unemployed. Mm. So combine all of this, life feels like a survival. Look, I'm just going to try and get through this. And I'm going to try and get through this. And I'm going to try and get through this. That was real quick, yeah. 
And that life shouldn't be about survival. We should create countries where, yes, there'll be challenges, but there's a baseline that everyone has access to. And then the rest is up to you. But if you're spending all your energy just addressing the baseline, how do you actualize your real potential? Because all this thing that I've, I've explained, I haven't, I haven't even talked about the potential, the talent, the ability that the person is born with. I haven't mentioned any of that. I just mentioned how they get through. So to really thrive and prosper, and let me be very clear, when I say prosperity, I don't mean everybody should be a multimillionaire and be a billionaire, but prosperity just means when you wake up in the morning, you're not worrying about whether you have food to eat today. Prosperity mm. means when you wake up in the morning, you don't worry about whether your child will get education and education. Exactly. Or you know, prosperity just means as a human being, you wake up in the morning and you have a decent playing field to start off with. And then after that, you do have to put in the effort to get to achieve whatever goals and dreams you have. And I think that that should be our, our aim in Africa. We should stop having conversations about, personally, eradicating poverty. Don't get me wrong. It doesn't mean that I don't think poverty should be eradicated. But I think the bar is too low. You know, and let me give you the example that I use in the book. If we talk about, if I came to you and you're a poor person mm -hmm. and... I said, oh, you know, I'm going to work with you. I'm going to eradicate your poverty. I'm going to make sure you're not a poor person anymore. Well, the definition, if I'm not mistaken, of extreme poverty is living on less than $2 a day. Again, okay, I stand yeah. right, somebody knows better. So technically, it means if I come to you and I say that I'm going to help you and make sure that you have access to $2.5 a day, I technically eradicated your you poverty, of poverty. yeah I, yeah i have but the question is if you're living on 2.5 dollars a day which many people are by the way are you thriving life isn't are easy are you prospering Great. life wow. isn't easy 2.5 a day it's still not easy but mm -hmm. technically you won't be counted as extreme extreme poor right so that's my point wow. that the, the the, bar, the point at which you eradicate poverty and the point at which people thrive and prosper, there's a huge gap. And I would prefer that our focus is on letting people thrive and prosper, not just passing the bar of poverty, because that is still too low. We are you know, human beings on the planet who deserve self-actualization like any other human being on the planet. Mm. And we are goal. I think at this point, uh, this is where we gave you the standard ovation. <laughs> That's a good job on that. We don't have much time. I'll try and then squeeze in these few questions. By the way, how do people get the book? I urge people out there to go and get The Bold New Normal by Lucy Quiz. When, where can they buy it here in Ghana? Okay, so we have it at um, uh, video bookstores, but also the easiest way to get it anywhere in Ghana, and in fact, anywhere on the continent of Africa, is to go to www.booknook.store. Book, okay. Booknook.store um, stocks the book and delivers anywhere you are, anywhere. anywhere. So you don't have to go, go searching and so just, just go to the website, place your order, and they typically deliver within 24 hours. Let's run through these next set of questions real quick. Um, let's talk about football. Um, you were appointed by FIFA as the vice president on the normalization committee. Uh, well, after Anas's, you know, expose. How impactful has the work of the committee been on Ghanaian football? And what key lessons did you take away from that appointment and working briefly with the committee? Um, so look, I'm not, I, I'm not going to delve into the background to the committee or it, the detail of the work that we did because we now have a new leadership team at the GFA and I think mm -hmm. that they, they, they started off doing a great job and I applaud them for that. I'd like to focus more on, on lessons learned. I think one of the things we have to recognize um, collectively is that uh, when, when something goes very wrong, um, and it becomes such an issue as this became um, on the international stage, it hurts the entire country because ultimately 
um, the image and, and the brand of a, a country has to be true to what happens, mm. but we have to know that what happens is good for the image. So that was an, a very unfortunate thing. Let me let me start off there saying it was unfortunate that we found ourselves in this position. I think as a committee, look, we were initially mandated to work for three months, then it got extended to um, six months, um, mm-hmm. and then to nine months, and and I, to what they then ended up being a full year. So I I I. Um, works through the first two uh, mandates. Um, I think it was a great learning opportunity for me personally. It was a privilege to work with a, a group of people. Um, so you have the four of us working very closely and then you have the broader um, football fraternity. I learned a lot uh, from the four people that I worked with very closely. Um, and that's that, you know, I, I keep emphasizing it's so important to have diverse teams who have different perspectives and different backgrounds. You know, you have a footballer, you have a you have an acclaimed business person, mm-hmm. you have um, a, 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 you know a, an experienced lawyer. You learn things you don't know, um, but also the wider football uh, fraternity working with everybody collectively helped me understand a lot about how um, we organize ourselves in Ghana, right? So this is more on a, a national, not so not the court. This is not about the corporate work that I've been doing, but really about how we organize ourselves and how we solve our problems together. Um, and I'd like to um, think that uh, the contributions I made from we re- in terms of the work around restructuring our business model um, and ensuring that we did it as a collective. So I don't know whether you recall, but the work done around the business model, whether, uh, whether it was around refereeing, whether it was around yeah, yeah. Um, the, um, um, uh, marketing and so on, was done through committees rather than sitting in a room and just lock, locking ourselves and do, creating all the ideas. And I think I'd like to hope that people walk away with the understanding that we need to learn to work in teams and value each other's experiences and backgrounds to create the best things we need for our country. So for me, it was indeed a, a great privilege that I, I, I treasure and I, I will always treasure the privilege of having mm-hmm. the opportunity to lead in that way. Great. So we mentioned earlier that our listeners could join in the conversation. I, Because of time, we can't really ask all the questions that we have in here. But one of them has something to do with what you just spoke about. So let me just go straight into it. It's from Osman Abubakar inside Cantonment. And it says, Madam Lucy, I've read, the, I've read the bold new normal and I totally love it. In 2019, you resigned from being the Normalization Committee VP. You mentioned your okay your reason was a person was as a result of a personal issue did you give up trying to fix the problems for which you were appointed with the issues beyond you two questions no um and i think that the interpretation of leaving is probably um misunderstood so i mentioned the mandate i mentioned the extension of the mandate i mentioned that um the focus of the business model, which I, I, I led and we got done. Um, in fact, we handed over to the incoming team the, the, the summary, which is actually uh, the size of, of a book of the work that we did on that. Um, and in the same month um, I left, and the personal reason was that I was starting a new job in London. So it was, mm-hmm. it was, simply, it was simply that. And I, I left um, in May, and in a month I had to start my new job. So right. it wasn't really about the, the committee. Uh, the work we were doing, it was about having to start a new job in another country. Maybe if the new job was going to be based here, I could have tried to juggle, but it, just, it was physically impossible to start a new job where, where I work now in London uh, and at the same time um, be meaningfully co- contribute to the, uh, to the committee. And I think it was important to show respect to my colleagues uh, and make sure that I was uh, upfront about it. Great. So... For the records, and if I'm not mistaken, you didn't quit the job because the work was over you. You quit because you were done with what you were mandated to do and you had to take on another challenge. Yeah, I know that I know that the, the committee went on to do more work, but I think in terms of the the, the contribution around business mm-hmm. models, remember my background is corporate, that contribution I'd I'd worked really hard with the team to deliver on mm-hmm. and I make it materialize into information that we could go on to share. But yes, it was about a new opportunity. And for those who were there, I came back and I was part of the, the Congress. So there was nothing 
um, that went on on toward in October. I joined them for the Congress where we elected the new, well, I didn't elect, I wasn't voting, where the Congress um, elected um, <laughs> president. Yes. Wow. Final, final one. What would you like your legacy to be if we were to tell your story? And what would you tell young people out there, especially women, struggling to identify their purpose in life? What advice do you have for them? You know, this question really makes me um, emotional. And most of the time, I trivialize, well, I don't trivialize it. I, I, I kind of lessen the burden of my response with, with the joke. The way I, I lessen the burden of the response is to tell people that, um, you know, I'm, I, 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 I'm pushing us because I want to be a happy old woman that when I'm old, the young people of today will be the ones running the country. And I want to make sure that they're doing a good job. So I have a good mm -hmm. old age. You know, deep down within the, the more um, explicit response is that I don't see why we as, you know, Africans or brown looking people shouldn't have the opportunities that the rest of the world or everybody else has. Uh, I believe the responsibility lies with us to create the future that we, we want. So I hope my legacy is of a woman who played her part in, in inspiring us to truly um, own our, our place in the world, um, thrive to be the people that we, we deserve to be. You know, when God created the world and he gave human beings uh, dominion over the world. He didn't give some human beings you know, dominion, the other human beings who have no, no dominion. He gave us this world to really make it what we, 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 we need it to be. And so I'd like to be someone who made a meaningful contribution in, in self-actualizing. I'd like to be an old woman who looks back and smiles every time I see, you know, that leader walking past. And I think, wow, I'm so proud of what we did together, and what we achieved. I'd like to know that my children and grandchildren especially will not be having these conversations because we've achieved it. And so they have different things to focus on. So what I say to young people and especially young women is that I think too often we, we, we're distracted. Um, I listen to conversations. I read what people post on social media. And um, I feel that we end up in such sometimes too many petty conversations where, whereas we should be raising the bar in our conversation and have genuine debates. Don't get me wrong. I like debate and people mm -hmm. having different opinions, but on topics that actually matter, on, on topics that actually move us all forward, not the little petty things that mm -hmm. we keep thinking mm -hmm. about. Be my advice, raise the bar of your conversation, raise the bar of your uh, engagement. And I'd like to um, you know, end on a note of, there's, there's one young person who commented on a post I, I made, I think it was on Monday or Tuesday. And I, I, I don't think I know her in person, but I think she's, she's, she understands me because mm. she commented on a post and said something like her hope was that I live to see us truly prosper. And I was just so touched by that comment because I felt that she understands what, what really matters most to me and yep. is that it will happen and I'll get to experience it. So whoever you are, thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy, for speaking to us. Honestly, the bones are very heavy. The knowledge you've imparted, you know, to us today is immeasurable. We thank you so much for choosing to spend time with us. I think initially the agreement was an hour, but we went overboard. Thank you so much <laughs> for staying with you us too. Me. We actually did two hours. Don't worry. Yeah, Don't worry. We're gonna we're gonna send the canvas to you. We yeah, might add an extra one for you as well. <laughs> yeah, I really. Thank you so it. much. We're gonna wrap it up. So for our listeners, Lucy really loves music. A choice of music, beautiful, urban. What YFM loves? She loves all our new songs. She loves the songs from Kiddy. Kwame Eugene, all of them, loves Yemi Alade's music, and especially French music. And so yesterday when I had a conversation with her, I told her I was going to play a song she's going to love. 
is by a lady called Aya Nakamura, and it's called Jaja. So that's what we're going to end today's interview with. It's been an awesome ride with Lucy Quiz, author of The Bold New Normal on the Wiley The Boat series. And on behalf of Global Media Alliance, YFM, all our listeners, the production team would like to say thank you. Yeah, that's a pa. I mean, Shraubi. Thanks for spending time with us. <laughs> sure, we'll definitely touch base with you. Have a wonderful day and enjoy the rest of your day, okay? Thank you. Enjoy your day. Okay, so, Bye. So the song is yours. Thank you. Bye, FM. Bye.